Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 154 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I have the pleasure of speaking with Calson Hoyle, who is a scientist turned mixologist specializing in events and DIY cocktail kits that look a lot like science experiments. Her company, Molecular Food and Cocktails, is changing the way that people think about their drinks by taking the hassle out of scientific mixology techniques so that people can actually experiment with them at home. But before we talk about emulsifying and spherifying, let's take a quick time out so that you can make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is Clarified Milk Punch, which is a beverage that heavily employs one key molecular mixology technique, clarification. We mentioned clarification once or twice during this interview, but we don't get into it too much, so I wanted to address it here for a couple reasons. First, clarification is one of the easiest molecular mixology techniques to try at home, and Milk Punch is a pretty simple, delicious entree into that process. And second, clarified milk punch is shelf stable, which means you can bottle this stuff and save it for later, or you can take it unrefrigerated on any summer outings you might be planning and then break it out several days into the trip without any consequences. In this respect, it's a super easy way to do a little project at home and then impress your friends or family when you visit them. In this case, we're featuring a milk punch recipe created by everyone's favorite syphilitic founding father, Ben Franklin. To make Benny Frank's personal milk punch, you'll need one 25 ounce bottle of cognac, a half of a nutmeg grated, or if you don't have a whole nutmeg lying around, use one half teaspoon of ground nutmeg, the peels of eight lemons, 16 ounces of water, eight ounces of lemon juice, 12 ounces of whole milk, the whole part is important here, any other type of milk is not going to work as well, and then finally, three quarters of a cup of sugar. This is about a two day process. So if you're smart, you'll start on a Wednesday evening, let's say in preparation for having your drink finished and chilled for Friday night. On day one, all you gotta do is peel your eight lemons and then let the peels infuse into the cognac in something like a large mason jar. This is the easy part. The next day, let's call it Thursday, you'll want to strain out those peels and discard them, you don't need them anymore. Then get out two saucepans, a large one and a small one. In the large saucepan, you're going to combine your cognac, water, sugar, nutmeg and lemon juice, stirring to dissolve the sugar. Then put your milk in the small saucepan and heat it gently until it's just about to boil. When it boils, Take it off the heat, then add the milk to the rest of the mixture, give it a gentle stir, and then place it in the fridge covered for several hours or overnight. So let's recap. So far, what you've done is you've made lemon oil infused cognac, combined that with citrus, water, and sugar, and then added hot milk to your punch-like mixture. Really not all that complicated. Once you've let your mixture sit for a little while, you'll notice that the acid in the lemon juice has denatured the proteins in the milk, separating the solid curds from the sugary liquid whey. This is the sciencey part of milk punch because you're basically using these proteins in the milk to strip away any particulate matter that makes the drink cloudy. Now it's time to strain. And the problem with straining is that most people either have very rough strainers like sieves or chinoise, or very fine strainers, like coffee filters. The problem with this is as follows. If you strain your milk punch from a sieve into a coffee filter, you'll only catch the largest particles and anything that escapes is gonna immediately clog your coffee filter, making it a miserable process. So what I'd recommend doing is purchasing something called a nut milk bag, or in some cases, a jelly bag. 
These are usually made of nylon, which is great because it's super reusable. All you gotta do is rinse it out and let it dry. And they serve as an excellent intermediate step between your rough pass filter and your finishing filter, which in most cases is gonna be a coffee filter. And for anyone who's rolling their eyes right now, thinking that the nut milk bag is overkill, you know what, that's fine, that's fine. You'll have plenty of time to reconsider your stance while you're staring at a coffee filter filled with goop. At the end of the milk clarification process, you should have a golden colored punch that is completely clear. And the real mind boggling thing about this beverage is that it doesn't look like there's milk in it. And yet you still get this creamy, rich mouthfeel from the whey. For more in-depth info about the history of milk punch and even more tips for making it at home, check out episode 76 of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast, which I'll link to in the show notes page. One last bit of housekeeping for this recipe, clarified milk punch still contains lactose. So it's unfortunately still off the menu for folks who have sensitivity to that compound, but for the rest of us, it's a fun way to bend the relationship between what you see in your glass and how you think it will taste. So now that you've got a fun little project to work on in your free time, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this conversation with Calson Hoyle of Molecular Food and Cocktails, some of the topics we discuss include Calson's journey from Nairobi, Kenya, to neuroscience labs in the D.C. area, to a budding cocktail and dessert company. What molecular mixology actually is, and which techniques and ingredients normally fall under this umbrella category. The magic of spherification, and how gelling compounds can add depth and complexity to your favorite cocktail. How Calson pivoted from events to DIY cocktail science kits in the wake of the coronavirus health crisis. Which DIY cocktail kits she's launched thus far, as well as which drink experiments are on the horizon. Advice for staging cocktail pictures as beautiful as the ones on Calson's Instagram page. How to prepare for your next boozy, flavorful vacation in Zanzibar. And much, much more. This is a fantastic intro conversation about molecular mixology. We go wide, not deep here. And that's important because many of the methods we discuss require specialized ingredients or equipment. So it's not something that people can just dive into. It takes a while to build up the skills, ingredients, and tools. To that end, we're hoping to do an Instagram Live video where Calson and I walk you through one of her molecular mixology kits and answer your questions about spherification. So in the days following the release of this episode, keep an eye on the Modern Bar Cart Instagram page for details about when that will take place. And if you're listening to this episode anytime after mid-July of 2020, head on over to our IGTV channel and check out the archived video of that live session. Without further ado, please enjoy this fascinating interview with the woman who's constantly blurring the lines between the science lab and the cocktail bar, Molecular Food and Cocktails founder, Calson Hoyle. Calson, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. So let's just kick it off by having you introduce yourself and uh, tell our listeners a little bit about your background and what you do. Okay, so I always consider that question really loaded because I have a very kind of like weird background, you know. I'm originally from Kenya. I was raised in Nairobi. I came to the States to college. So I went to George Mason and Georgetown University uh, and my major was science, basically. So I studied neuroscience. That was supposedly my career direction <laughs> until I became a mom. So I became a mom. Uh, I'm a mom to two very awesome boys. And so when I was staying home with them, I was looking for things to do with them. So I started doing like, you know, science events or parties for kids. So, you know, I it became really popular with some mommy friends and I started that as a business. So I started a company called STEM Kids and that was about 2012. Um, so, and I still do it, uh, of course, with COVID it's different, um, but that's how I started. So all, all the time I would do parties for kids, the parents would always say, oh my God, this is so cool. I wish I could do, I could have a science party, you know? And I did an event um, with 
an, an, an amazing mentor. It's actually um, Susan Gage, the owner, he's called Chap. And he actually really inspired me because he really thought that there was something there if I kind of like extended that aspect of my business to the adult or, you know, event industry side. So I, no rebranded, I kind of like formed a sister company called Molecular Food and Cocktails that did science themed cocktails and desserts because I, you know, I mean, we're adults, nobody wants to do slime at a party. So <laughs> the obvious way to do a science event with adults was to do cocktails and desserts. So that's why it's called Molecular Food and Cocktails. So that's like the genesis of how I ended up starting the company um, where we do science themed um, food stations and cocktail station bars. Um, and it's not a full bar. So when clients hire me, they don't anticipate that I'll have like a full bar. It's always one or two signature drinks that has like an experiential aspect to it uh, with all the experiments that we do or the look or how they enjoy the drink. Yeah, you know what? It kind of reminds me of the popularity of the the wine and painting mm -hmm. uh, type type situation yeah. where people have. It, there's such a demand for that that people have actually um, launched entire like spaces de dedicated to it. So uh, it seems like it's kind of in that vein where you know adults do want to get together, they do want to socialize, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. the flavor aspect of it seems to be a, a big draw. And especially when that flavor mm -hmm. has some explanatory or like, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, attention capturing aspect to it. It seems, it seems like that, uh, really lends itself to a, a really cool overall experience. Um, and obviously <laughs> that's something we're not getting at bars right now. Right. And, you know, I often consider those stations like bar stations or, or whenever I present it to a client or whatever, I always tell them it's a con conversation starter or enhancer you know what i mean so it's very easy all the events i've done it's always been comfortable for guests or anybody to come over and say oh what do you have here like it's really really you know easy to get comfortable relax and just experience an event in a different way um you know and it's kind of just cool and i feel like for millennials and people who like the modernist type of um events or experiences, it sells really well because they get it, you know, like it's, you know, smoky drinks, color changing drinks, you know, mm -hmm. what, what is that? You know, like uh, the most fun parties I've done were, you know, they've always had that quirky element and just taking things to the next step. Yeah. One of the things that I will always do if I'm in a position where we are doing like a little cocktail competition or where we're um, mm -hmm. like a people's choice uh, competition, I will always mm -hmm. serve a pink drink or a drink, you know, the butterfly pea flower syrup that does the mm -hmm. changing of the color. Like if right. you have something vibrant, if you have something eye catching, if you're able to put a little bit of spectacle into it, you know, right. dry ice, et cetera, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's, an, it's, yeah. It kind of, I think it goes back to that old adage, you know, you eat or drink with your eyes first, you know, you, you, mm -hmm. and, you know, so I think that's, uh, especially true and, and to find interesting ways to, um, extend what that means, right? It's not just, mm -hmm. not just the arrangement of food on a plate, not just the placement of a garnish or a, a you know, a special mm -hmm. rim on a cocktail, but literally, right. you know, fog, you know, emanating right. from the, it's like, wow, that's next level stuff. Um, right. so I guess before we go too much further, uh, I think it might be useful for us to talk about what molecular quote unquote, either gastronomy mm -hmm. or cocktails are because I, I think it's a term that a lot of people have heard. Um, but I, I don't know if everybody has the same definition in their head. So what does it mean to you? And then maybe if I have a different take, maybe we'll talk about what it means to me and come to like more of a overall definition of it for our listeners. Right. Right. So for me, when I started the company, I think I just approached it very broadly. So I'm not tied to a specific technique or specific tools. So for me, you know, I was willing to try anything as long as it's a product that can be delivered in mass. So like if I have an event for 400 people, 
what technique or tools can I present that efficiently in within the scope of the project, right? Like if it's a event at the National Museum, like it's a thousand people, like how are you going to do that times a thousand, right? So for me, I was really wide open to what I would define. And that's why I think I call it food and cocktails, because I wanted to include um, ice cream. So I've done an event with beer floats where I've made ice cream and there's beer. That was an event at the zoo. So it really is wide ranging. So, you know, the techniques range from emulsification where, you know, you can make foam, you know, put a, an element in a powder or a liquid and make foam out of it. It can include something called spherification. And my kids are basically focused on that because that's the one and spherification is basically a method in the food molecular space where you take two elements. One of them is uh, salt, and another one is you know. Uh, so this, usually it's sodium alginate and calcium lactate. So the goal is to have them react when they mix together and form this bubble, right? So depending on which one is mixing into what, it can either be a big bubble where you can make a giant mojito bubble or tiny spheres where it's sodium alginate, but it's, you know, you form a, membra a membrane with the calcium lactate. So the salt forms the kind of like membrane. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's verification. That for me is what I put in my kids right now, because that's, you know, that when I do, even for the kid experiments, it has to be something within 90 minutes or shorter time can give results. So I'm not going to send an experiment or make kids wait for two hours because, you know, people like quick results. You know, if it's too much work, then it's not enticing. So when I look down at everything that I do, unless I'm doing it um, at a big event or like a specific event, if I'm sending it into you, to your house as a kid, it has to be enticing for you to want to do it. If I send it to you and say, put it in the fridge and wait eight hours, then, you know, it's it's not as exciting, right? right. Um, so that's one of the methods that you would consider in molecular gastronomy. So spherification. Uh, I use a lot of liquid nitrogen. That's fast freezing. Um, that's also considered part of molecular gastronomy. Mm -hmm. um, I've done some smoked drinks. Um, for that, very small, intimate events where I, I just use the ISI whipper with nitrous oxide to like infuse flavors and just teach the aspect of using a gas like nitrous oxide and pressure to int it, like introduce flavors to something right mm -hmm. so that way they're learning about a chemical react how you're changing a solid or the flavors of a component of a drink with this tool and technique to arrive to what you're doing um and then another you know and one that i think when I usually, someone asks me, what is molecular gastronomy? If you make jello shots, you basically, <laughs> you're molecular gastronomist, right? <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the, some of the ingredients in jello are obviously, if, if not the same, then uh, comparable to mm -hmm. some of the ingredients in the spherification compounds that you're talking about, right? Exactly, right. And so when I look at it from the cocktail or bartending perspective, I look at all these methods, techniques and everything and how I can translate that into a, a, a drink, right? So I can use a food dehydrator to make, you know, like garnishes, right? Or sugars or salts that are flavored, strawberry sugar. I can use something like, um, this one is one of those that's probably impossible a century you know have you had you know what a centrifuge is right mm -hmm. so yeah, if you want to really you know separation technique that if you wanted to really get concentrated flavors for maybe like carrots or tomatoes but it's not accessible that's the only thing about the centrifuge that i wish for. <laughs> it's one of those expensive tools that you know uh it's out of reach so i rarely consider that for events you know uh, i've had events where i do wine slashes and usually i just make i use liquid nitrogen basically to make wine slashes mm -hmm. um so 
when I look at the overall aspect of how you can use molecular gastronomy, I approach it from all those aspects. Like, how can I use liquid nitrogen to freeze this drink? Or can I use a, you know, cocktail garnishes that have been dehydrated? Or can I, you know, use an emulsifier to probably top the drink? Um, sometimes people just want the visual and I just use dry ice um, because liquid nitrogen has been notoriously been misused and this danger associated with the use. And I think people just don't put the effort to learn. So when I started this, I made sure that I went to North Carolina to this company and did like a two week training on the retail um, use of liquid nitrogen um, because it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something you want to pour on a drink and serve. You know. Yeah, that's uh, that's cr that intense. I mean, I, I figured that you just took like a you know a couple hour video course on like two weeks to to handle liquid nitrogen. Uh, right, and it was two weekends. So okay. we drove my husband and I drove to um, Asheville. It's a North Carolina kind of like artsy town, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we just had like an intensive you know how to handle the gas, uh, the dangers, and every aspect because you know when i get my supplies i get it from a welding company or people who supply hospitals and so you know but it's if you know how to handle it it's safe mm -hmm. um but you gotta know what you're doing yeah yeah so we'll, we'll throw in a little disclaimer on the front end of this episode and say hey don't yeah. uh, don't don't play with this at home <laughs> so a couple things i want to point out here um one obviously you know as people think about some of these methods that you've just described, there's some that you mm -hmm. tend to do at events, right? Like liquid nitrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you also have this kit aspect to molecular food and cocktails and the kits mm -hmm. uh, involve stuff that people can actually do themselves without you being there. Obviously, you know, you mm -hmm. provide instructions, you walk people through it, but uh, so there's a kind of a hands-on DIY aspect that you can do in the comfort and uh, safety, I guess at this point in time of your own home. Uh, and mm -hmm. then, you know, the more I, I imagine the more um, complex or difficult to pull off methods mm -hmm. where you do more at events. Uh, so like with the liquid nitrogen, the dry ice, stuff like that. Correct. Correct. Exactly. Um, yeah. You're right. And that's, I think, how I, I, you know, I would never want to ask someone i remember one time someone oh why can can i make the smoke out of you know i i don't even usually recommend go to the store and just get it x pure because you know the liability aspect you know mm -hmm. is kind of like you know serious and i even for the business side the, the there's like special insurance that you gotta because i think it it's become popular so there are a lot of liquid nitrogen ice cream places uh popcorn. And so just the liability aspect, it's one of the things that I wanted to make sure it's ironclad. Um, but stuff like spherification or emuls you know, emulsifying stuff, that's something that you can definitely DIY. So I usually have a de uh, detailed pictorial instruction card in the kit mm -hmm. that's to show you exactly. And I usually, because when I started the biggest thing, or even when I do experiments with kids, the moms can put together a science party. So I think for me, where I come in, I bridge um, the ease in which they can do that, right? So I make it the most easiest, you know, simplify the steps, measure, pre-measure. So when I send it to you, you don't even have to measure anything, just the water or whatever liquid goes in what, but it's weighed and measured already to go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I like doing that because it also decreases wastage. Like if you get, if you were to buy just a regular kit, how many times are you going to make the the drinks, right? right, right. <laughs> so, yeah. So the pre-measured detailed instructions, I think, would just give you like that smidge of fun and you would still get to experience the fun cocktail. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that I thought was uh, kind of a... Uh, a binding characteristic of all these methods that you were describing earlier in terms of, you know, what, what types of, um, production methods would qualify as molecular, um, mixology. I think they all mm -hmm. to me involve transformation. 
Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, at its heart, a cocktail is something that is greater than the sum of its ingredients, right? We put all these individual ingredients inside a shaker or a stirring glass. Mm -hmm. And then as we combine them, we transform them, usually with ice uh, and dilution. Uh, and, and through that transformation, you now pour it, serve it, and here's, here's your cocktail. Uh, but, but with the molecular aspect of it, you know, one of the things that seems, you know, particularly compelling to me is that the transformation seems to be particularly intense, right? There's, there's mm -hmm. some, something intense about this transformation that requires either, uh, advanced knowledge about how to do it. So mm -hmm. here I might be thinking about something like the Ramos gin fizz as something that kind of bridges mm -hmm. the gap between uh, molecular uh, mixology and regular mixology because it was invented at a time when, um, you know, some of these advanced methods were not available. And yet, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that you have to, you know, do the reverse dry shake with it and then, you know, shake it for another five minutes uh, until you can get this, you know, head of foam that is several inches high, like yeah. that's emulsion, right? Exactly. Uh, and yeah. and so it, it's, it's, it's building on some of these same principles. Now, if you look at some of the things that you see in fancy bars today, well, there are some bars where they actually have like, um, there, who who was it? There was somebody who actually took a paint, you know, those paint can shakers at the hardware store that shake the paint really quickly. Really? Yeah. Uh, I think somebody, who was it? I can't remember the name of the, uh, the cocktail author who did this, but he actually went down to Tales of the Cocktail a few years ago and brought a, a couple of paint shakers and literally made Ramos gin fizzes out of like paint can shakers. So you can see, wow. you can see how yeah. like the equipment uh, allows you to do a couple things, obviously at scale, which is something that you're concerned with in your events. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of these uh, techniques were invented initially as ways to produce or preserve food and drink uh, in large mm -hmm. quantities. So it kind of makes sense that they would be most useful at scale. Uh, and then also, you know, the what you were mentioning before with how you pre-measure all of these uh, ingredients, you know, one, one of the things that I see standing be between a home bartender like myself, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. and some of these advanced techniques like spherification is the fact that like, well, how badly do I want to give cupboard space to ticaloid powder and um, agar agar and all these different mm -hmm. um, you know powders or gels that might be necessary to this, and then also risk the fact that I might mess it up and not do the measurements correctly, and then end up with a drink that was you know maybe supposed to have a little uh, foam float on the top, but ended up like pudding consistency, right? Like. Yeah, I, yeah. I, there's a high risk of me messing it up. So yeah. to me, I think that's where I see a lot of value in um, the kits and obviously the events that you do because you're you're kind of you're you're getting people's feet wet, uh, but mm -hmm. they're still enjoying themselves. Right. Yeah. Because a, a lot of the times, even when you when I try to sell the idea, I you know, I, of course, flavor is great. If you make the most awesome, tasteful cocktail, that's amazing. That's what we want, right? But nobody's going to buy the kit just because they're going to get blue spheres, right? Right. <laughs> right? They're going to buy the kit because they want to do the experiment, mm -hmm. right? So that's why I really try to um, uh, not sell, but kind of like put that forth as the reason why you'd want to buy the kit. Uh, it's uh, recently I sent to my friend and she took it to the beach and it was one of their, one of the night activities that they did. Um, so it was like just a bunch of, you know, guys af after spending the day. So it was a thing that they wanted to do together. Mm -hmm. Of course they could have had regular margaritas, but just following the instructions and doing it and, you know, like having this detail step-by-step -step was an experience that they were willing to indulge in because I made the process easier, right? So, and, and even when I put it in the kit, I usually say as an optional experiment. So mm -hmm. you might want to do it, you might not want to do it, you know, but try to do it, right? Right. Uh, and I, right. I, I think that's uh, also a great option for people who have like standing Zoom happy hours, for example. So like, let's mm -hmm. say there's a bunch of people right now who have a standing happy hour on a Thursday, Friday or Saturday with their friends or with their coworkers. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. you know, if you can plan ahead and grab and make sure that everybody gets the same kit, then you can all sort of like be, be making this making together, right? 
I am actually working for an, uh, we are planning an event like that. Yeah. It's in the works. Yeah. It's, it's really exciting. So we're planning on doing in a couple of months with, uh, a corporation so uh-huh. that's what we're planning to do so like a hybrid event so you can have like a dj and they'll try to market it and then once the members or participants are ready they can get the kits mm-hmm. which will have like it's going to be custom for them and then everybody will be making the same stuff on the night of the event right um yeah and i think that is actually a very good angle for corporate you know, like the corporate arena, because I think social events might slowly come back, but for corporates, it's going to be extremely hard, right? So for the end of year or employee, you know, um, if they have events that they normally have in December or November, this would be a great option where it could be like a gift box that I send their members or employees or whoever, then they get together and do this a live Zoom event where everybody is making the same cocktail, you know, and everything is in the box, right? Mm-hmm. So the the only thing that I don't put in the box is liquor because in Virginia you cannot. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> everything is included in the box, uh, including the citrus. Citrus is very easy to ship, so you know that's usually okay. Yeah, well, that's great, yeah. and, and I, I anticipate um, that there's going to be a lot of businesses uh, on the other side of this pandemic that decide just to mostly uh, do remote work and maybe have one headquarters mm-hmm. and just have everybody else be remote. I, I'd see that as a very real possibility. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the, the downside of that is that you don't get the camaraderie, you don't get the in-person atmosphere, uh, but you still know your coworkers. And, and so I, I think this is just a, a brilliant, uh, a brilliant way to try and take the circumstances that we're all trying to cope with and make them actually fun. Um, and yeah, and you know, when COVID happened, I honestly thought it was the end because <laughs> what I do involves people, right? I am selling the idea of come around the food station. Let's talk about this thing. You know, so it involves people gathering around the station. Mm-hmm. So I honestly thought there was just no way. So it was like a sink or swim situation. And I, I had to really brainstorm how I can bring that experience at home if because for me 2020 is definitely wiped out all my events are either postponed or canceled so it's either wait a little bit and see if things get better or try to do something as you wait um so I'm really excited that the kids are you know they're trying to uh, they're probably resonating with some people. Yeah. You know, I hope it picks up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this yeah. is, you know, it's, it's, it's always good to have a, a business that has a little bit of flex, a little bit of bend like that so that when something changes, you can always, uh, do a little pivot. But, um, so talk to me about some of the kits you've launched to date, because I, I think we, we were talking a little bit off air and you mentioned that you were kind of testing out different models for how this works. Obviously there's the subscription mm-hmm. model personally, I'm not a big subscription guy because to me, it mm-hmm. seems like, uh, a lot of, a lot of maintenance and maybe the possibility that I'm not going to like what I get every month or yeah. every week or however yeah. often the cycle is. Um, right. But then there's also, you know, you're, you're, you, we were talking about the fact that you were just, you know, carrying some inventory and, and, um, trying to sell them more as, as gifts, as individual gifts for right. people to give to one another, which I think is brilliant. Um, so right. talk to me about some of the actual kits themselves. Absolutely. So I've launched four so far. Uh, so my next one is a mojito kit. And it's funny you talked about the butterfly pea, sh- pea flower because that's one of the experiments in that kit. So the first one I started with was like a pilot. I only had 24 kits and I just did it with my friends on Facebook. And it was a pineapple. You know, I I was just testing shipping and how it travels and the nooks and crannies right so i i remember the very first one i used to i used a, ma- a mason jar you know it had some garnishes that i made um i think it had a fruit but it was a very simple kit mm-hmm. so 
I just wanted to first just test everything, how things travel, how things ship, how the box arrives, the experience and all that. The second one was a margarita kit. Um, it was a 12 ounce kind of like um, bottle. And so it comes, it's Mexican themed, of course, uh, with all the what you would get in a margarita. So there's lime. Um, I try to stay away from herbs because they don't ship well, you know, so I just ship the stuff that travels well. So citrus, sugars, garnishes that are dry, like dehydrated garnishes and the mix itself. Right. And then of course the experiment is the pre-measured uh, cal uh, calcium lactate and the, the mix. So I usually have a mix of what the spheres are going to be. So for the margarita, it was spicy agave. So mm -hmm. I made my syrup and that was what the kit uh, spheres would be. The second one was, it came right before uh, third, third box was before Father's Day. So I did an old fashioned. That one did really well um, because I think everybody wanted like a cool science kit for their dad. And so that one was fantastic. It had a tool, uh, an old fashioned mix, uh, sugar cubes that were Angostura bitter, like bitter infused sugar cubes, um, instructions and the, uh sphere experiment experiment for that was cherry um mm. like cherry spheres so you could make the old-fashioned with cherry spheres uh, and so the next one is the mojito kit so the mojito kit is going to be you know a mojito mix and then it's going to have lime i'm, I'm it's going to have like the uh, butterfly pea sugar cubes that is, it's aimed to transform when you mix the mojito um and so i'm trying to think about if I'm, I want to do like three types of uh, sugar cubes in there or so that they can experiment with different kind of like uh, drinks and then have like a variant of garnishes. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can you have like an infinite possibility uh, of making a mojito. So if you take the base, use an X sugar cube and then use garnishes, you can make strawberry themed uh, mojito mm -hmm. and then uh, the sphere when i do the spherification uh experiment i just try to keep it one thing so like for the mojito i would probably do like watermelon spheres Ooh. for example oh yeah 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 so, yeah. yeah yeah because mint and watermelon are such a great combo, great combo. See, yeah i like that absolutely. i love that yeah yeah right and so when you get it i usually just say get liquor and herbs that's the only thing you got to get which isn't yeah. bad because you, you got to go shopping mm -hmm. anyway. You got to go shopping anyway. And even if you're, I wish I could, even if yeah. you're shut in voluntarily or involuntarily, there's right. always Drizzly. You know, there's always right. uh, alcohol delivery services. They can do that for you. So, you um, yeah. so there's no excuses. Or, you know, there's no excuses. Or, or even if you really want it, I think when I do my sugars, there's going to be like our diverse, like basil sugar. I've shipped basil sugar, actually. The first kid had basil sugar. So if you didn't have, and it was at the height of quarantine, so nobody could go anywhere. So I included basil sugar in that kit. Mm -hmm. uh, so that if you didn't have fresh ba uh, basil, you at least have basil sugar. Yeah. Right. That's great. Yeah. Well, I really love that approach. And I love the idea of taking even a simple cocktail and mm -hmm. um, demonstrating the ability to kind of pick it apart and then mm -hmm. reassemble it in a different way for a different outcome. I think that the mm -hmm. idea of recombination, uh, sort of like the um, what, like deconstruction and then recombination is also mm -hmm. something that fits in with the theme of molecular mixology because um, you know it's it's stuff that is happening. It, it involves forces that are happening below the surface that we often can't see. But then once you're, you know, once you can actually go in there and pick them apart and then tweak them just a little bit, then you can have these dramatic sweeping, either textural flavor or, um, you know, chemesthetic changes to it that are, that are really compelling, right. I think. Like, yeah. When they, when it changes in the molecular level. Right. So that's just, that's kit number four. So I have like 10 upcoming kits that I'm really excited about. Well, I've done four, so six more, mm -hmm. you know. I want to have a mimosa kit. I think that that would sell well as a brunch kit, right? Yeah. So like if you have ladies that brunch, you can get the kit and do that. Uh, I want to have like a basic cocktail, a basic kit that you can use for any needs that you have in the bar. So like have like an array of sugars, an array of garnishes mm -hmm. that you can 
make an epoxyl and use that kit to enhance the drink. Right, right. right. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, Julep, I'm really excited to kind of like formulate that kit. Um, and then I think I have uh, gin and tonic, uh, Moscow Mule, and a Bloody Mary mm. kit. Um, yeah. So, Very nice. So just different. So each kit will have the science element, right? So either, you know, color changing aspect, emulsification, or spherification mm -hmm. part of the molecular gastronomy. Have you thought about yeah. doing any uh, clarification? So I did that at a small event. Um, that one is a hard sell. Yeah, it, it, it's well, and I, I think, you know, what it is, is it's exactly what you were yeah. describing earlier is that clarification is a process that takes multiple steps and you have to leave something in the refrigerator overnight. And it, for a long time, yeah. yeah. And I did it with milk. So I was going for a clarified, clarified milk cocktail. Mm -hmm. So the goal was to have this clear cocktail, right? You strip out all of the lactate right and you just maintain the milk flavor right and just strip out all the whiteness so you get this very clear liquid that tastes like milk mm -hmm. but it's not milk right um it was it was so because it was a class and people saw the process it was really hard to to kind of you know it was very mixed reactions mm -hmm. you know yeah so yeah have you tried that one you've yeah you've done it at home right yeah I've, I've done i've done clarified milk punches at home before i really love them i think they're really cool texturally um but right. you know you do learn a lot like you know you, you'll read these recipes online and they say oh we'll just pass it through a coffee filter that doesn't work mm -hmm. you know yeah, you need you yeah, need yeah, like yeah. several layers of layers uh, and layers of different and layers. um straining things you know you got to put it through cheesecloth then a nut milk bag and all this stuff and you know if if you plan it can be done really well but i could very easily see someone um getting frustrated with it and then getting mm -hmm. sort of turned off. So I, I like that, you know, you're kind of staying in your lane as the person who does accessible. And then, you know what, if you want to go and do more research, you know, if you're the person who takes this as like a spark of an idea and then mm -hmm. is prompted to go and do research and try to replicate it yourself, maybe by purchasing right. a book like liquid intelligence, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's a, yeah. a really amazing well, guy. Personally, I like experimenting. So I've experimented with that, you know, and other things that I know to the masses it would not do well mm -hmm. because of just the, you know, how easy it is to do, the taste profile, you know. You know, I, I remember when I did this clarified milk punch, she was like, oh my God, the allergy aspect. Um, you know, I had, you know, so there's a lot of education that you would require to just make people jump over the bridge to go to this other side and do the experiment, right? Um, so right now, I usually just focus on ac things that I feel are accessible and require fewer steps and would make it, you know, like not as demystifying as, you know, like, oh my God, what is that? Mm -hmm. um, of course, I, as a scientist, I'm so big with science. So I usually get super excited when someone asks me the process. I just bubble on and on and on. Um, that I, I like that about ScienceCon, but you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea. So I usually, you know, you want to learn great, but I'm not going to push it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. one last thing I wanted to talk about while we're still on the, on the topic of all these um, molecular methods. Now I've, I've mm -hmm. had one cocktail with the spherification method applied to it. It was several, several years ago. I think it was at the first time uh, my wife and I went to the Columbia room here in DC mm -hmm. and they had that mm -hmm. as one of their aspects. I think the theme of that menu was islands for whatever it was. So it was very, very g general theme. And I think this might have been some sort of like Japan, Japanese and Peruvian cocktail because there's a big connection between Peru and Japan in terms of uh, cross Pacific trade and uh, immigration actually. So um, that was mm -hmm. what they drew up, but they had these, um, at least one of the cocktails we had had these spheres in it. And I'm a very textural person. Usually if I don't like a food, it's because uh, the texture turns me off, not necessarily the flavor. Mm -hmm. So can you explain mm -hmm. to people what the experience, so like you, you get these spheres, 
the spheres contain mm-hmm. some sort of flavor and then they also have mm-hmm. a bit of a texture. So is it like, is it like biting into like, do you, do you chew them? Do you just sort of swallow them? How do they play into the drink experience overall? Probably chew. I think the best way when somebody asks me is I always ask them, do you have kids who like boba tea? Mm-hmm. You know, the, the Thai boba tea. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know the spheres, they are huge, humongous, mm-hmm. but it's meant to burst in your mouth. So, you know, when you make it, it, the membrane encapsulates the liquid in there. So there's a little bit chew on it, right? Um, if it's reverse crispification and it's a big bubble, you probably experience that more because you bite into this chunky giant bubble and it pops, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the spheres are more chewy, um, but minuscule because I don't... When I put put that in the kit, I don't envision someone making like a whole bowl of spheres and just like, <laughs> you know, like put spoonfuls, right? It's um, it's just a tiny bit, right? Um, and a ve- I'm a very visual cocktail. I like pretty cocktail pictures. Mm-hmm. So, oh, and your Instagram you know, is wonderful, by the way. Right. Thank you. Um, so it's something that you'd want to just do it and take a bite or take a very cool picture and just enjoy the experience of making the spheres, right? But they do have a chew to it. I don't mind, I have a very diverse flavor profile. My kid has actually the issues with the texture. He doesn't eat eggs, he Mm -hmm. doesn't eat pancakes. Mm -hmm. Calls them mushy. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, I understand that for some, the, the, you know, texture aspect is a thing. But, you know, the way I try to present it, you know, you know, making a lot, just a spoonful is enough to make you, you know, quell to your curiosity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah. what I like about uh, either the, the spherification or the reverse spherification you were describing where it's kind of one giant sphere, uh, almost like mm-hmm. a bubble that holds uh, some some other sort of flavor. Uh, what I like mm-hmm. about that is that. Uh, it really is another one of those transformation moments because you're taking the traditional flavor profile of, say, the old fashioned you were describing, right? Um, you can take a sip of the old fashioned without taking any of the spheres in, and then you take a second sip, and maybe you grab a sphere on your way by, mm-hmm. and then you bite down on that sphere, and suddenly you get this burst of cherry flavor. And cherry bitters, mm-hmm. you know, one of the more, more popular riffs on the old fashioned is either using cherry bitters or in the style of the, the Midwest. Um, old fashions with the the muddled cherry and orange in it. So, you know, mm-hmm. it really does tie back into the identity of the old fashioned, but it allows you to kind of sample a couple of different takes on this flavor profile. Um, and, and I think that's where some of the delight and surprise comes from and just being able to kind of take it this way. Okay. And now maybe I'll try it this way. Um, right. it, it's a really cool, diverse experience. And I, I think when, when I look at the kits that you put together and also the experiences, mm-hmm. I think there's this beautiful density uh, or, or this dense amount of energy and, and preparation mm-hmm. that goes into each drink. So it makes, even mm-hmm. if you're just having that one drink, it makes it super mm-hmm. special. And I think that that, mm-hmm. that to me is the draw because I'm not going to go out to a bar and have this mm-hmm. spherified old fashioned. I can't think of any bars mm-hmm. yeah. in my immediate vicinity that are serving spherified old fashions, but exactly. it's cool now because I can skip that whole bar visit and just do it at home. And there's some, it's, it's almost like suddenly you're like giving me some superpowers or something that, that, and that's right. really intriguing to me. Right. And I like the, what you just said about, you know, different ways of making it. And usually that's how I approach it. Right. Like in the kit, I look at a margarita kit and how many ways can you get, a drink out of this, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, can you deconstruct X to get a different take on it? Can you include X to either elevate or just alter it a little bit? Can you do a science experiment and just change how you experience it? So when I'm designing the kit, I start classically, right? I look at the ingredients of the drink and then I just kind of like slice and dice ways to introduce science or experimentation in either the garnishes, the um, the mix itself or um, the fruit or any element of the 
cocktail that can be played with. I usually am intrigued by that. Yeah. Well, um, so obviously we'll have all of the information so that people can visit your website and check out these kits. Um, We'll we'll list that on the show notes page and at the end of the episode here. Uh, But I wanted to talk about two big things before we jump into the lightning round uh, here. I wanted to talk about, uh, obviously staging photos because as you mentioned you're you're into beautiful cocktails and you have an right. incredible instagram that deserves way more followers um oh, thank I, you. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan i subscribed as soon as i visited <laughs> i subscribed immediately um oh, thank you. Yeah. and uh also i want to talk about um resources really quickly we mentioned liquid intelligence but um, for folks who are compelled by the list of techniques that we mentioned earlier Besides liquid intelligence, are there any other books or online forums or places where you go for information when you're researching something um, like uh, perhaps like a new emulsifier or something like that? Where, where do you go to, to learn some of these things? So liquid intelligence is my Bible. <laughs> liquid, you know, that is the basis. When I embarked on this that is the first book i got you know um and i just i was telling everyone oh my god this book is amazing because it's really granular right he really does an amazing job of and if you're if you have a science background you like things uh presented that way right then you can you know rationalize why is the heat at x amount of temperatures right um so it's just that is my bible but most of the time i just i think the internet has really revolutionized how people have access to information a lot of uh the molecular gastronomy um information i've gotten was mostly from europe so a lot of websites um you know in spain or and usually you have to translate but i think the movement started in uh was it france or spain but this one guy so a lot of materials i usually when i see something it always starts there then i see it catching Mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. somewhere else so from apart from liquid intelligence honestly it's um just been google google youtube um i like following what grant is doing in alinair um Mm -hmm. that's so i follow him religiously to just see how where the trends are going or look at his previous work uh but mostly i just usually start with liquid intelligence right um if yeah if i have an idea i go back and just read uh what he's talking about you know the, that specific cocktail and the you know the history and everything then i build from that um and i I'm, i didn't actually go to bartending school so <laughs> You know, it's I haven't been in a bar for X amount of years. So I, you know, I don't have the privilege of that. So I really had to really make sure that respectfully, um, just make sure I'm informed with the drinks and all that. Usually when we have events, of course, I hire bartenders and, you know, who work in D.C. and know the basic information about a cocktail. So, like, I did an event in Charlottesville and it's way easier if the team knows the basics or the classics right you don't have to explain anything so when you're training them on the science aspect or your approach it's re- you know you're past that introductory step they you know uh, that all they have to learn is just this one element that the client brief uh, once for the event. Sure, sure. I mean, that makes complete yeah. sense uh, on my end. Mm-hmm. I think what you were mentioning um, with the the European connection, uh, there's a famous restaurant called uh, El Bulli. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. I believe the gentleman responsible for that is Ferran Adria. Uh, yep. And so that uh, that restaurant, there was a few dishes that he did there uh, using this molecular gastronomy, these techniques uh, that really caught on, mm-hmm. really compelled, uh, captured the imaginations of uh, a right. lot of people. Unfortunately, you know, to get a reservation there, you you know, you'd have to fork over half a year's salary. Uh, in in many cases, it's just one of those uh, once in a lifetime uh, things. As sim- similarly with Alinea, um, mm-hmm. uh, so a couple of things to mention. Alinea is a uh, a very similar restaurant located in Chicago. I believe their sister bar is called the Aviary. Uh, I believe mm-hmm. the Aviary is part of yes. the Alinea group. And uh, they recently 
released a very expensive but also very um, molecularly inspired uh, cocktail book, the, the Aviary mm -hmm. uh, cocktail book, uh, sort of in the same way that you'll see cookbooks coming from The Dead Rabbit or Death & Co. or PDT, right. some of these famous, um, usually New York bars. The Aviary did something similar, but it, it really does have that molecular bent. And unfortunately, it is one of those books that's going to cost you like probably yeah more than a hundred dollars so i haven't purchased that one yet but that's also for anybody who gets to liquid intelligence and just decides that they really want to go all the way down the rabbit hole that might be your next stop would be the aviary uh cocktail book um so in terms of resources i think that's that's where i go to as well and then um you know hopefully yeah start with yeah starting with liquid intelligence i think is a good uh, go and then in dc i think jose andres has mm -hmm. uh his place and even Co columbia room has you know uh some awesome cocktail experiments right 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 um it might be interesting. Uh, I don't know if you're doing planning on doing anything with um, oranges, but uh, I know in Liquid Intelligence, Dave Arnold has a really cool acid-adjusted orange juice where the, uh, mm -hmm. the he takes the acid profile of an orange, so it has the flavor of an orange but the acidity of a lime, and and he does daiquiris with that. Um, so that's that's one of my favorite like easy little experiments of like all right, all you need is a little bit of uh, a little bit of citric acid and a little bit of malic acid, which are powders, okay. and all right. of a sudden you have orange juice that. It tastes like orange, but has the acidity of a lime. So it's all, it's all of a sudden right. this, um, this trippy thing. Charlie and I have actually uh, done that experiment together, Charlie from Element Shrub. Oh, that's cool. And yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I'll try and put a link in the show notes page to, uh, to that experiment that we did. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to cover here is the beautiful photos that you take. Um, now everybody has slightly different, um, aesthetics, different, uh, ways that they prefer to stage photo shoots. So what is your aesthetic and how do you achieve the, the beautiful pictures on your Instagram? I would call my Instagram for photography as a metamorphosis as well. When I started, I, it, it's really hard when I'm doing an event to stage it and take beautiful pictures. Sometimes it's at night, you cannot control lighting. So for the events that I do, it's really hard to do that. So when COVID happened, I knew, I know I have a science aesthetic that I'm going for. And if you look at my older photos, I try to include a science element, you know, like either stage the photos as a solar system or as a math formula or something, you know, I had so many fun, crazy ideas about levitating garnishes, you know, like having them stuck up and give you the illusion that they're floating on the drink. Um, but the whole aesthetic that I think I'm going for is that it's not just a regular cocktail when you come to the page. There needs to be an element of science. So either with the background or staging, I've done a couple of pictures that are, you no know, videos that are, you know, like the dry ice, they're smoky and, you know, they give you that sense of something happening on the pictures, but it requires a lot of planning. So a lot of times I always start with a drink because that's the subject. So I figure out, like the, I did a daiquiri, so I staged it as a, um, just to give you an example, as a solar system. So I wanted to stage all the planets as fruits around the cocktail, right? So do a very beautiful cocktail and do this overhead shoot where, you know, I, the background is the solar system and stage the elements of the daiquiri that would go in the drink as planets circling around the cocktail. So that obviously requires, you know, you have to consider the subject, the garnishes that go in the in the picture, right? The time of the day, like the weather, because I, I am not a super good photographer. <laughs> so I call myself an amateur photographer. So natural light is my best friend. I think, you know, it's hard to control the weather, but I feel like, lighting is way better because you want your drink to be refreshing and vibrant and you know you want the strawberry to look like a strawberry because I don't like going post editing and just like stripping away elements that because that's harder to control so if you have a good picture 
then, you know, it's, you won't require a lot of work. Um, so some of the older pictures during COVID are super complicated because I came with all these super crazy, you know, like sets, you know. I remember when I did the levitating apple, you know, I had to string with fish wire the apple and measure how, you know, it took a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you saw that image. Yeah, but it was really it, neat. It was like, oh my God, this is all. So after a while, I was like, you know, you can still achieve a good picture without, you know, uh, of course, the props and how I love it, it got better, mm -hmm. right? I don't need like a giant prop thing and things floating. Um, so now I'm just focused on doing a good, fresh, bright, clear cocktail. Mm -hmm. Um, if there are times I want to double and introduce them, um, uh, like the, I've played around with the idea of doing uh, prints on cocktails. So you do like a very frothy drink and then play, use that as your converse for, you know, um, decorating your cocktail. So I did a very, very cool, um, uh, and I just use like an Etsy uh it was a brain imprint. So I just ground strawberry sugar mm -hmm. and then just kind of like did that print on the cocktail. Um, so that one is simple. It doesn't require a lot of props and time and prep. You should see my scene when I'm done doing my photo. It's like mayhem. My husband walks in and he's like, what is going on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah photo shoots and video shoots tend to be way more complicated than anybody thinks they are, uh, on the, they, on the consumer side. Yeah. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I, but like the, I love what you're saying with the, um, the, the, the foamy head, the foamy egg white or aquafaba head, because it really is a great mm -hmm. staging ground for, for either the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the spice or sugar art that you're mentioning, or, you know, bitters art, you know, you see bartenders, especially on drinks like the Pisco sour, they'll take like a little mm -hmm. cocktail pick and they'll draw little things. And they're just like a barista will with a latte. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's before COVID, I think I was, uh, talking with this guy because it's actually and i think that's probably the direction of the trends right there's a machine that actually prints out like the the edible ink mm -hmm. um uh, this one was really cool because it's it was meant for high volume right so if you have a hundred people it should take you it, i think if you put a drink there it, it was just 10 mm -hmm. seconds and it was very it's digital so you could take a selfie and send it to your drink and they so that's where i was hoping to double in a little bit uh but of course things change right so. with the with, you're saying at the events <laughs> yeah the right. events yeah. so that meant for high volume like especially in the corporate world if they want to do their logo that's something i envision i could sell right to clients that you know it's something you can consider like if you want to do like either connect it with you know if it's amazon if they want the amazon logo on that or facebook or sure. you know yeah well that's fascinating um i recommend that everybody uh check out your instagram to, to see some of those uh photo stagings that we talked about especially now that we can appreciate all the work that went into uh, levitating <laughs> that apple and creating that solar system around yeah. your daiquiri okay. And if, when I did all of them, I always included the BTS photos and the setup. So if you go to my Instagram, one of the pins is a BTS because I include like even on I think on that particular photo, I included on the carousel, like the steps and how it looks, minus all the light and, uh, and everything. Mm. Um, but because I think it's. It's so fun when you see these pictures of floating strawberries and spaghetti and all that. Um, but I really did challenge myself because when I was taking this it was during the quarantine, like the hardcore, like two weeks, nobody go anywhere hardcore <laughs> quarantine. So I was really limited. So I had to be really, really creative. And I found that that pushed me to really think out the, outside the box, mm -hmm. right? So it really pushed me to be you know, creative with, you know, once I had an idea of what I want to 
take what picture I want to take, then I just had to make everything fit into the picture, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. 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 So definitely everyone check that out over on Instagram. We'll have all the details and links over on the show notes page. Kelson, is there anything else you wanted to share uh, with our listeners, either about your company or uh, about any of the kits before we jump into the lightning round? I would just encourage people to have an open mind, you know, when you, uh, when you go to the site and you think, oh, I don't know about that. I just, I would encourage, I think everybody to just have an open mind because I know you can enjoy a regular cocktail, but I'm just pushing you to just look at it from another angle. You can always go to, you know, a restaurant and get a to go, um, margarita, but take open open up your mind to experiencing the margarita differently, uh, and that way, you know, uh, when you see the kids and they have a science exper- experiment, it's going to be approachable. It's not something that's going to be super foreign or anything. Right, right, yeah. cool, mm-hmm. beautiful. Yeah. All right, jumping into the lightning round here. First question: What is your favorite cocktail of all time? And if you don't have a favorite, what's something you've more recently fallen in love with? Okay, so that was so interesting because I was like, oh my God, where would I start with that question? (laughs) But I thought I would just probably describe my dream cocktail. And that that was going to be on my plan this summer. I'm probably going to still do it. So I saw this guy make a corn uh, cocktail. He made like, uh, he boiled corn and the husks and everything and blended it, right? And then... uh, um, Seemed, so like separated the solids from got a very 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 clear liquid out of it and made syrup out of mm. it and then he took uh sour cream right so it was it's the basis is an elote cocktail mm. i thought that was so fascinating i was like oh my god i have to try this and so he made like a a syrup with the corn husks and the ground corn that was boiled and every sweet corn, mm-hmm. right? And then he took a uh, cream, right? And I think he shook it up with uh, some liquor and everything. And it was this beautiful, frothy drink that I was just, when you see the process, you want to taste the cocktail. Mm. So I, I, my plan was to do, and I'm probably going to do it. I'm going to make that cocktail and then I'm going to do a levitating corn on top and try make like a video. So you'll see the corn, you know, like when you cross section cut a corn and mm-hmm. then it's going to be levitating on top of the cocktail. Oh but, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be yeah. That's great. I think that would be very fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and we're uh, corn season is right around the corner, so oh, I was, that's what I was waiting for. <laughs> I was waiting for the corn to bloom. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah. Awesome. So that's yeah. All right, an elote inspired cocktail. So that's your that's your dream cocktail. I love it. That's my dream cocktail. You know, I hope it tastes good as because you know when you build up something in your head. <laughs> Yeah, well, and yeah. I think I, I I love the idea of of um, you know kind of blending corn because it, even the silk you know the husks have this uh, this slightly green flavor to them, and I can see that playing really well with the uh, you know the the very sweet uh, sort of juicy mm-hmm. kernels. Um, so yeah, I, right. I, I, who doesn't love corn, right? It's it's right. A, you can even yeah, you can even grill the corn husk as the garnish, right? Ooh. And put some uh, cayenne pepper as a cayenne pepper, salt or sugar on the rim. Oh. I can envision it already. Oh, yeah. there's this place uh, that I follow on Instagram, not because, um, I, I think it's it's not because I'm particularly interested in them, in them as a business, but they have the most beautiful shots of elote. It's called Taco Rock mm-hmm. and it's on your side of the river. Are you familiar with it? Uh, no. Check it. Is it like, is it the place where they put, it, it's like, the elote in a cup? No, it's like it's legit like grilled corn with the street, the the cheese and the cayenne pepper and all the uh, like the oh. di- the diced um, green onions on there. Oh my goodness! It now is, I gotta find it. It looks incredible. I think they're called Taco Rock. So for what it's worth, anybody okay. who's across the river from DC and in Northern Virginia, check them out. Uh, Taco, <laughs> yeah, Rock. Taco Rock. That is some Got elote. It. If you're not familiar with what it is, just look at their Instagram and you will understand and you will be hungry. So, okay. all right. Yeah. Next question. If you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be mm-hmm. and why? Okay. This is very clear. I would be ginger. 
because I love ginger. <laughs> I try to put it in as many cocktails as I can. You know, I love ginger. You know, I put it in tea. I put it in food. I just grind it with garlic and do the paste and everything. But ginger would be it. Yeah. You know, the ginger juice, ginger uh, paste, or anything ginger that would be. Yeah. yeah, and one of the things I love about ginger in the cocktail space mm -hmm. is that it doesn't have a taste in the same way that like a simple syrup is sweet or salt is salty or bacon or something, you know, like that would be considered umami. Well, ginger is not really, I mean, there's a little sweetness maybe, but like in general, you're getting this flavor effect that is greater than just a basic salt, sweet, bitter and it really, right. it really adds something uh, to the entire mouthfeel uh, of the drink. And I think in that respect, it's, it's very, uh, very refreshing. So I love ginger as well. And, right. and, and you can go each and you can go sweet or sour mm -hmm. with it, or even just, you know, so ginger is very versatile. Uh, not many people like it though. You know, I don't know if it's from my spicy background that mm -hmm. I just grew up with ginger and everything that, you know, it's, you know, it's not that intimidating. Um, but I love it. Yeah. Same here. Um, yeah, I just made one over the weekend that was pretty successful. Ooh, so I, I made one a couple of days ago, actually with nectarine ginger. Ooh. Uh, so I think I had a dash of bitters and it was with rum. Oh, that sounds amazing. No, it was gin, gin. It was, it was London gin. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. That mm -hmm. sounds delicious. Okay. So next question. If you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Uh, just paint us a little picture. Okay. So believe it or not, my husband does not drink. So he's out of the picture for, for sure because okay. I'm not going anywhere to drink with him, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he just doesn't drink at all. So I just thought about two of my very good friends, uh, uh, my best friend, Dar, and then my friend, Kitchenista. I don't know if you follow her, yeah. the Kitchenista. Ooh, it's familiar. I yeah. know, I have to start um, following. You have to start following her. She's uh, She recently moved to Detroit, but she's an amazing food blogger. Uh, she's very inspirational and uh, you got to check her out. Like her food is amazing. So we've all, every time we got together, we just always talked about spices. So if I was to take a trip with her, we would go to Zanzibar, the spice route, mm -hmm. and just enjoy the seafood, the spices and drinks over there, like Zanzibar cocktails, if there's anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that would be my dream trip. And then Dala, my best friend, she's just like a hoot. She drinks anything, anywhere. <laughs> so I find her very, ex, you know, open to experiences. And so that that would sound like a very cool girl's trip. Oh, yeah. yeah. Amazing. And yeah, yeah. Zanzibar, just, yeah. The, I mean, literally the, the port city that for mm -hmm. so many hundreds and thousands of years was sort of like the entry point, uh, you know, from to, to the east or to the west, depending on which way you were you were traveling, uh, and especially due to those uh, those monsoons that that play such a big role in why India and the Far East have such a, a, a beautiful spice culture, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so th there's actually is really uh, fun historically to to research into mm -hmm. some of those spice routes and and some of the influence that some of these places right. and cultures had in the spread right. of these flavors around the world. So I think that's a right. great it, answer. It really is because I'm from Nairobi, so that part of East Africa, inland, it made uh, hair. So it's you know it's a familiar flavor profile for mm -hmm. me but i just feel like the diversity you can you barely scratch the surface if you just look at just the basic ones like i feel like if you go to zanzibar uh you would experience spices in a whole other level for sure for sure well that's a that's a great answer and uh if you have a spare uh spare ticket for that trip just um let me know. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right what is a common or traditional cocktail ingredient that you've never tasted and why Okay, so this one is, I have never had an Abyssinian, so I have an accent. How would Americans call that? Uh, the very high proof, 74%, um, you know, yeah. I've never had it. 
am I intrigued about? I don't know. I, I just, it's one of those things that it's, I just never dabbled in. Mm-hmm. I've never tasted it. No. You know, I know it's, there's a technique in how you consume it with water and the drops and everything, but it's just, you know, it's just one of those things that I've never tasted. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, absinthe is interesting. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's one of those drinks that can also be polarizing sort of like ginger, because I feel like in the same way that some people are either really into ginger or really not into ginger, the same goes for the anise, uh, licorice style flavors and, and absinthe is almost, uh, almost always very heavily dominated by the wormwood and, and, and anise. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have an episode called uh, absinthe minded with uh, Mark Viertaler, who's a distiller who makes it in Frederick, Maryland. So anybody who's yeah. interested in learning more about absinthe can check out that. Uh, and then actually in your area, uh, mm-hmm. in Northern Virginia, it's maybe, you know, Middleburg is not exactly in your area, but, uh, you know, uh, right. just an hour outside of DC or so Mount Defiance distilling in Middleburg, Virginia, um, led by Peter Alf and uh, his team, uh, they, they make a, a very beautiful absinthe as well. So we do have some local absinthe for people, uh, here in the DMV area that are interested in that. So maybe worth checking out. Um, and well, especially maybe. like with the transformation that you're talking about, that's an interesting mm-hmm. one because, uh, it, you know, it's, it's called Lushing. And it's, mm-hmm. it's when the the contact with water causes the oils in the spirit to drop out of suspension, which is really neat. Mm-hmm. Um, th- right. So that's that's also kind of a cool little visual thing to play like with. Like a science story, yeah. yeah. But, you know, like what I was looking into, it was like one of those things that's very intimate. Mm-hmm. Like you cannot do that in high volume. No. There's just no way. <laughs> no, you know? it's not. No way. It's not easy. So maybe that's why I didn't even care about yeah. it. I was like, okay, this one you cannot replicate. Exactly. Times. Exactly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, absent. That's uh, definitely check that out. Um, I think Mount Defiance even sells um, smaller bottles, so you don't have to commit to oh. a, a full seven fifty. <laughs> cool. All yeah. right. Last question here. What is an unusual or possibly controversial view that you hold in the mm-hmm. spirits and cocktail world? Okay. So this is going to be funny. Keeping it simple. <laughs> that is. <laughs> So for very obvious reasons, what I do is, you know, it's, uh, it's I'm selling it to be simple, but it's not selling the idea of keeping it simple. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I don't know if that's controversial, though, because, you know, a lot of times they say, you know, shake only fruity drinks and keep it simple and focus on the ingredients. So, you know, the taste and all these elements of the perfect cocktail. Right. And so when he says, keep it simple, I'm like, but really not. Cause I want you to do our science experiment. Mm-hmm. So just, you know, go a step further. So, you know, I don't know if I could call that controversial or I would say it's uh, not antithesis, but it's, it's contrary to what I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it, right. it's it's interesting because I think some of the most difficult drinks to make are the simple mm-hmm. ones, and and that's why people say, well, if you want to find a good bar, go somewhere and order an old fashioned, or go somewhere and order a martini or a Manhattan. It's almost always mm-hmm. or a daiquiri. It's usually one of those four mm-hmm. drinks people use as indicator cocktails um, based on their mm-hmm. personal preferences, and they're difficult to make because they are so simple. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's, it's difficult. I think what's controversial about simplicity is that there's a couple, there's a couple forces pulling us away from it. There's a, the temptation to get super nerdy about it and then just go off and and, and before perfecting the old fashioned, you're already on to, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, a a milk, uh, clarified milk punch, but you haven't, you haven't really learned the the basics of the first thing yet. So I think there's that impulse. And then also the fact that cocktails are inherently greater than the sum of their parts. That's the idea mm-hmm. behind a cocktail. So there's mm-hmm. this inherent complexity wrapped up in cocktails that is very mm-hmm. seductive. It's kind of like the two plus two mm-hmm. equals five situation. It's like, oh, that's the mm-hmm. magic. How do we get there? And so I think the impulse mm-hmm. to keep it simple is controversial in that it requires a little bit of discipline on our part. <laughs> right, right. And humans are inherently curious, right? I think that for me was my basis for wanting to be in science and all that. Cause I was just a curious kid. So I wanted to ask why, what, when, what, you know, why everything is happening. So I feel like humans are just inherently curious. They're always looking for 
answers to questions or they're open, they want to explore the next, you know, Mm -hmm. barrier to something. So even if it's a simple cocktail, you know, just, it doesn't mean that you just take the sum of the elements and just, oh, just make it, I push you to explore a little bit more. Like, look at that orange then. Uh, Would, you know, where the orange is coming from matter in that old fashioned? So indeed it's simple, but Can you, if you come from the basis of curiosity, can you investigate on the aspects of the orange or the cherries or whatever, like would make that very simple cocktail elevated or different or just custom or just take it to the next level. So keep it simple is great in its, you know, idea and everything, but, you know, because we are, you know, curiosity is a human element. I think it pushes us to at least, you know, uh, try to be a little bit more curious and push the boundaries. Yeah, yep. I couldn't agree more. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm actually, I will share something with you. I, I mentioned it in our, our, the episode immediately preceding this one, but, um, my current, um, challenge is the Bloody Mary. This mm-hmm. is a, a challenge that I've been assigned somewhat and somewhat that I've assigned to myself. And so right now mm-hmm. I have a, a spreadsheet with 40, kind of a meta analysis of 40 different bloody mary recipes and it's mm-hmm. incredible the variation in the different volumes the different ratios mm-hmm. of relationships mm-hmm. between the key ingredients that you find in all bloody mm-hmm. marys it's absolutely mm-hmm. crazy and you know just like going back to asking that simple question of like well what about the orange does it matter where the orange comes from what about the cherry what mm-hmm. you know how just asking simple questions like that i don't think people realize <laughs> <laughs> how how deep you can get just by asking simple questions <laughs> like that because i have these visualizations just from these you know it took me a couple hours of just going through online and through some of my cocktail books and i have some some visualizations that you mm-hmm. would not believe in terms of the yeah. inconsistency of what's out there so yeah. it really is a cool yeah. opportunity and I, I think that asking questions is this the way to go right there's actually a page I follow that only does Blood Marys. It's called Bloody Good Bloody. Oh. She's uh, she's about 11,000 followers, but it's called Bloody Good Bloody. Mm. Um, and all she does, her page is just Bloody Marys in every aspect, every way. That's awesome. So well, it. I will check that out. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad I mentioned it. Yeah. I'm glad I mentioned it. And that's mm-hmm. what helped that that also helps because um, you know, when we have conversations like this, we help each other with our own projects. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So good luck. Yes. All right, Kelson. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Before we jump off here, can you just give us all of the ways to digitally connect with you so that uh, our listeners who are curious can reach out if they have questions or um, maybe even purchase a couple of your awesome kits? Absolutely. So my main website is called molecularfoodcocktails.com. So www.molecularfoodcocktails.com. So this is the flagship website. It has all my event uh, details and everything. Uh, and then I'm very active on Instagram at Molecular Food Cocktails. Um, and there you'll find links on the bio to the shop. So if you want to buy a kit, follow me on Instagram at Molecular Food Cocktails. Uh, and then, you know, you can send me an email at calcin at molecular food cocktails. If you want to, you know, ask questions or if you're curious about anything, I promise to respond as as soon as I can. I'm very accessible, but follow me on Instagram. I try to be there every day um, because I think I want to try and just visualize, build the the Instagram portfolio a little bit better. For sure. Um, Yep. And that's um, C-A-L-S-I-N for the email. So, um, yeah, thank you again so much. I'm very excited, um, for the kits that you've been putting together. And, um, again, just thank you for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. Thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. So thanks to everybody uh, for listening and we'll catch you next time here on the modern bar cart podcast. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The 
other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners, and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed. Molecular Mixology Insights, courtesy of Calson Hoyle of Molecular Food and Cocktails, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2020.